My name is Brian Banks, and I'm a pretty weird person. I have borderline social anxiety, I'm athletic as a potato, and have no interest in drinking, sports, or other activities that bring men together. I'm decent looking and thin despite never exercising, but my main asset is that I'm smart. In fact, I'm very smart, and unlike many smart people, also perceptive. Despite my borderline social anxiety disorder and the fact that I skipped one grade in elementary school because of the neighborhood I lived in and the schools I went to, I didn't fall behind when it came to sex education. I lived in a middle-class neighborhood. I don't know if that was the reason, but there were a lot of beautiful women around my age. During college, I lived at home because one of the top five engineering universities in the world was only 10 minutes away from my house. In exchange for helping women in my neighborhood with their homework, taking home tests for them, or tutoring them in various subjects for community college admissions, I myself received. I would call it tutoring. Between the ages of 18 and 21, I was almost always satisfied, and more than half of the women I tutored and who tutored me seemed to be genuinely satisfied with my abilities too. I was taught so much because I quickly gained a reputation for patience and discretion, as well as intelligence. I was able to communicate with my companions on their intellectual level so that they easily understood the subjects I was helping them with. I was always kind and gentle with them, and never, never, never told anyone else that I had sex with one of them, although I'm sure they told each other. Only one woman, she always called herself by her street name Jezebel, rather than her real one, Whitney, was not treated with much care by me during this period. However, it wasn't because I didn't try to be nice to her. Jezebel is my age. She is a large woman, the same height as I am, and at the time probably outweighed me by 5 to 10 pounds, although she was not fat. Jezebel was very active. She was also athletic, playing softball and basketball in several leagues. Although she was not particularly educated, she was not stupid and had more ambition than most people in our neighborhood. Her main goal was to own a studio or website. I tutored her mostly in math and business, which would help her achieve that goal. I never fell in love with Jezebel, but I definitely liked her and was willing to do anything for her. In my senior year of college, I invented an easily programmable, encrypted, sophisticated proximity detector. It's kind of like the easy pass system used on many toll roads in the U.S., only specifically for secure systems. Various forms of my detectors have been adopted by corporations with proprietary systems, many government agencies, both state and federal, and the military. I had to obtain a security clearance in order to participate in patenting my inventions. Through my inventions, I received tons of money in patent royalties and created two companies to sell products in different markets and to research new products. Since I have no management ability and am only interested in inventing and developing products, I had my attorneys set up a network of shell and holding corporations that owned my two operating companies and hired people to run these corporations. I owned all the stock in the ultimate holding company, but someone would have to be very sophisticated and spend several days searching to find that out. I never used my network of companies to cheat on taxes, but some of them were located offshore to make it difficult for those looking for an owner to find me. The only people who knew I was the absolute boss were the CEOs and CFOs of my two operating companies. To everyone else, I was just the hired head of new product development for one of the operating companies. By the time I turned 24, I had established all the mechanisms described above and was looking for a long-term relationship with a woman. I found it difficult because of my borderline social anxiety, but after visiting several dating sites and various social groups when I turned 26, I finally met someone I was in love with and interested in me. Allison was probably the most beautiful woman who had ever shown any real romantic interest in me. Although our courtship was quite ordinary, I realize now, looking back, that it was more superficial than most others. Perhaps I was so enamored with her looks that I overlooked some things that many would consider important in a spouse. However, one thing I noticed consistently during our relationship was her complete lack of interest in my work. She never asked me anything about it, seemed bored and feigned incomprehension if I started a conversation about my work and was completely devoid of curiosity. Allison's lack of interest in my work actually turned out to be an advantage when it came to the prenup. Gail, one of the attorneys who had helped me form corporations, and someone I respected greatly, insisted that I get a prenup. When I hesitated between a prenup and a prenuptial agreement after I proposed to Allison and she accepted, Gail threatened to quit working for me if I didn't present Allison with a prenup. Gail drafted a prenup that was very simple and unburdensome. 
It simply provided that the only thing excluded from common ownership was any stock, shares, or royalties associated with any company or patent that either of us owned more than 10% of as of the date of the marriage or even acquired during the marriage. Allison had her father review the document and then signed it without even asking me about it. I had been married to Allison for about two and a half years, and we already had our first child, a beautiful baby girl we named Amber, when I ran into Jezebel on the street during a quick, solo trip to my parents' house. I offered to buy my parents a new house in a more fashionable neighborhood, but they were people with a simple lifestyle and lots of friends in the neighborhood, so they declined. Jezebel looked good. She hadn't gained a pound since I'd last seen her, and was better dressed than any other time I'd seen her. We had a cup of coffee each, and she told me about her new endeavor, and I told her the same story as I told everyone else about working for hire. Jezebel was building an unusual website, but she was having trouble with her finances. I delicately inquired about it, and found out that she only needed $25,000 to make it work the way she wanted it to. I asked Jezebel to meet me in a week, at the same cafe, same time, and I could introduce her to an investor. She was very happy to do so, and as I was leaving, she gave me a big hug and kissed me carelessly on the cheek. I thought about it for a week. The $25,000 was just a blip on the screen to me, and despite the questionable nature of the business she had a hand in, I still had a crush on her. A week after our first meeting, we met again, and this time she looked even better than before. The coffee had not yet been placed in front of us when I handed her an envelope containing $25,000 in cash. Jezebel was shocked. She even cried, which I never expected from someone with such a tough exterior. Jezebel offered to gift me a share in the site. I politely declined, saying I just wanted it to be a gift and I didn't need any ownership stake. With her body and motivation, I'm sure she would have honored her promise, but I politely declined that as well, saying I love my wife. Your wife is a lucky bitch, Jezebel said through tears as we parted. If there's anything I can do for you, just ask, and it will be done, she said in all seriousness. Best of luck to you, said I with a wide smile and gave her a big hug. Allison and I had two more children, a second girl, Whitney. No, I didn't name her after Jezebel, but readily agreed with my wife when she suggested the name. And then a boy, Jerry. Although Allison pleased me, over time I became convinced that she was actually quite shallow and materialistic. She had other good qualities, however, and I truly loved her, the only woman I had ever loved. Even more important to me was that she gave me three wonderful children. Amber, who was 12 years old at the time, had her mother's beauty and the best character traits of Allison and me. She was as smart as I was, tested at the same level of genius as me, but was infinitely more outgoing. Ten-year-old Whitney was also a beautiful girl, though unfortunately for her, she inherited some of my traits that, while not homely, were not in the same class as Allison's or Amber's. However, Whitney was the most caring, loving, and empathetic person I'd ever interacted with and could light up any room with her mere presence. She also didn't hide when her brain shut down. Eight-year-old Jerry was just a fun kid. I don't know where he got it from, probably from Allison, but he was a real athlete. I got interested in baseball and basketball just so I could have a healthy discussion with him about his favorite activities. He never had a bad word to say about anyone, was always in a good mood and got along great with both of his sisters and they with each other. You would think that with such wonderful children, I would think Allison would be a great mom. Unfortunately, that was not the case. The main conflicts that Allison and I had were related to parenting. I'm not sure what it was, maybe just a green-eyed jealousy monster, but Allison had a bad relationship with Amber. She was too hard on Amber and sometimes cruel in her comments. I had several fights with Allison right in front of Amber when Allison treated her badly because I just couldn't take it. By the time Amber turned 12, it got to the point where Amber never went anywhere with her mother unless I went with her too. This became a real problem when one summer Allison wanted to take the kids for a week at the lake house her family had when I needed to work. It took all my powers of persuasion to convince Amber to go with her and a real confrontation with Allison to make sure she would treat Amber well during the trip. Although Allison was better with Whitney and Jerry than she was with Amber, she had her moments with them as well. Also, even though Allison was a stay-at-home mom, I probably spent as much time with the kids as she did, since she always had one activity or another going on, and the time I spent with them was usually of a much higher quality. So, after being married for about 15 years, having three wonderful children, 
a wife I loved and enjoyed very much. Even though we didn't have the perfect marriage, I was driving home from the airport after a one-night business trip. It was about one o'clock in the afternoon. Even though I had told Allison my itinerary, she hadn't paid attention to it as usual, and I didn't know if she would be home to meet me or not. I was at the stop sign, preparing to turn right onto the through street where I live, when a car I recognized drove by. It was Roger Mayberry's red Corvette. The top was down and he was clearly visible in the driver's seat as he played with the radio dial and tunes blasted from his speakers. Roger Mayberry was one of the top salespeople in one of my corporations that dealt primarily with military sales. He understood our technology as well as was even possible from someone who was not an engineer and was easy to get along with people. Like virtually all of our employees, he had top-level clearance, even higher than most, since the military application of our technology was even more sensitive than any other. What is Roger doing here at this time of day? I asked myself naively. Since the street I live on is a through street, I didn't even consider the fact that he could be at my house, about two blocks away. I just wondered what business occasion could have brought him to this end of town. After a minute or so, I pulled up to my driveway, entered the house, and, not seeing Allison on the first floor, climbed the ornate spiral staircase that Allison loved and had to have to the second floor. My shoes on the marble floor of the hallway made a distinctive slam, slam, slam sound as I approached the open door of the master bedroom. When it was about ten feet to the door, I heard a sultry voice say, Did you forget something, Raj? Shocked, I walked into the bedroom where Allison was standing. When she looked up and saw me, her smile was quickly replaced with misery and she half shouted, Oh, Brian, damn, I'm so sorry. Unfortunately, within a nanosecond, my mind had fully comprehended the situation, and feelings of anger, disgust, anxiety, hatred, and fear raced through my brain at the speed of light. I'm sure I froze in place with my mouth hanging open as all the other emotions that had been weighing on me coalesced into one sensation. A gloomy, dark, overpowering sadness descended upon me. I remember stumbling back a few steps, but I don't remember anything else until I woke up in the hospital. The monitor had obviously alerted the nurse's station to my awakening because a nurse came running into the room a few seconds after I opened my eyes, followed by a doctor another minute later. How are you feeling, Mr. Banks? A pretty middle-aged nurse with a name tag of Nancy innocently asked. It's like my head is in a vice, I moaned. We're so glad you woke up so quickly, she purred, taking my wrist while looking at the monitor next to my bed. Why am I in the hospital and how did I get here? I asked, just as the doctor walked in. Mr. Banks, I'm Dr. Petra, replied a short and very pleasant female doctor of Indian descent. Let me look you in the eye and then I will answer your questions, she continued. Sister Nancy still held my wrist, and Dr. Petra took some kind of light source out of her pocket and, without shining an intense beam into my eyes, shone it back and forth, moving my eyelids and the skin around my eyeballs with her soft but firm hands for a good two minutes. When Dr. Petra straightened up, the nurse released my wrist. They both smiled and Dr. Petra said, Mr. Tra. Banks, you have a concussion. According to your wife, you tripped over something in your bedroom, fell backwards onto the marble floor in the hallway, and hit your head on a rock. You could have died, but your vital signs are normal, and your concussion is probably not as serious as we feared. Instantly, a shroud of sadness came over me again as I remembered what had caused my fall backwards. My eyes widened and I groaned loudly, Vomit! Fortunately, Nurse Nancy had quick reflexes, and some sort of container, though not a barf bag, was under my chin in no time. Despite not eating lunch that day, I threw up whatever was in my stomach, mostly bile. When my stomach was completely emptied, I lay on my back. Nancy put a cold compress on my head, and Dr. Petra performed another examination. After completing it, she announced, I am very surprised at your regurgitation, Mr. Banks. It may indicate a more serious concussion than I thought, but there are no other signs. Could my reflex reaction be the result of a memory of the emotional crisis that triggered my fall? I asked, already knowing the answer. Yes, it's entirely possible, Dr. Petra pondered, stroking her chin. Did you have such an emotional crisis? Yes, I replied sullenly. I didn't react very emotionally to my wife cheating on me, I snorted. 
After a moment's hesitation, I was even proud of myself for not using any bad words in my vocabulary. But you couldn't tell that from the shocked expression on my orderly's faces. By the way, I continued wryly, not waiting for an expression of pity from either of them or myself. Where is my faithful bride? Well, she was here, but she left to pick up your children from school, Nancy replied, beginning to regain her composure. I looked at my watch. It was 328, so she was probably picking them up right now. Have you eaten recently? asked Dr. Petra with an ashy expression on her face. No, not since about eight this morning, I replied. Since your regurgitation was obviously emotional and not caused by a concussion, I strongly suggest you take something to your stomach. Especially before your wife gets back with the kids, she said. You don't think I'm going to throw up again when I meet her, do you? I asked. No, I don't think so, replied Dr. Petra, unless it's something harmless. Nurse Jenkins, could you ask the kitchen to bring a bowl of oatmeal porridge over here? With cinnamon and raisins, no brown sugar, I said, turning to Nancy and trying to be as pleasant as possible. The oatmeal arrived five minutes later. I finished it quickly and felt a little better by the time Nancy came back into my room and said, You have company. My three sweethearts ran into the room, each trying to get to me first. Darlings, don't touch Daddy's head or neck, I giggled, trying to hold all three of them in my two arms. They all spoke at the same time each more animated than the other. Despite my physical and emotional state, I had to giggle. A real laugh would probably hurt, but a good giggle was definitely called for. I hardly noticed Allison so busy talking to the kids. It was obvious that Amber had been crying, but now that she saw that I wasn't on death's doorstep, she was clearly perking up, and the other two were smiling. Allison stood at the door with a bewildered expression on her face. As I interacted with the kids, I avoided talking about my injury as much as I could and turned the conversation to what they were doing yesterday while I was out of town and what they were doing today. Allison entered the conversation a few times with questions or comments, but I just ignored her and didn't make eye contact. After about 15 minutes of fun, I noticed Nancy say something to Allison. After a minute, Allison announced, Kids, Daddy is still sick and needs to get better, so we have to leave now. Kiss his hands goodbye and we'll visit him again tomorrow. The kids kissed my hands and waved goodbye as they left. Amber was clearly better than when she'd arrived, and Jerry seemed fine. But now, when I got a good look at myself in the hospital bed from the outside, Whitney started crying and turned her head sharply as she walked away, obviously trying to hide her tears. After the kids left, Allison called out to them, Meet Mom in the elevator lobby. I'm going to talk to Daddy for a few minutes. Allison turned and walked over to me. I didn't have time to fully think through my reaction, and obviously at this point I couldn't act out the scenarios I had already thought of. So I just closed my eyes and listened. Brian, I'm... I'm so sorry you had to see me like this. I didn't want you to find out. I'm sorry that I'm... Well, not the wife you have a right to expect from me. I really hope that when you're better, we can talk things over, she told me with a note of moaning and sobbing in her voice, but no real tears. Getting absolutely no response from me, she said, You might want to talk tomorrow. If you want to, just give me a call. Her last statement was telling in itself. She obviously wasn't interested in coming to see me in the hospital. I would have to ask her and talk to her or she wouldn't have come. Dr. Petra came in again about 20 minutes after Allison left. After another examination, she said, You don't seem too upset after talking to your wife. I didn't talk to my wife. I brushed it off. However, while I still feel deep sadness over the loss of my previous life, I am quite confident that I will be able to transform my emotions into action. I will no longer feel nauseous. That's good, she said with a smile. Doctor, how long do you think I should stay here? I insist that you stay one more night after tonight, but after that, if your examination is good, you can leave. But you must limit your activities for at least a week, and certainly not come into the office for at least three or four days. I insist. She replied in as firm a voice as only a woman five feet tall could do. I promise, I grinned, then reached out and took her hand. That is, I promise on the condition that you do not tell my wife that you will release me on Friday morning. Of course, I can't ask you to lie to her, but if she even inquires, can you hint that I'll have to stay until Saturday? 
I think I can do that, laughed Dr. Petra, as long as I don't have to outright lie in answer to a direct question. I'll tell Nurse Jenkins the same thing. I ate a heavy dinner called my parents, whom Allison had not contacted for obvious reasons, called my assistant at home and asked for a pad and pen. I felt too out of sorts that night to write down everything I needed to do, but the next morning I would definitely be ready to start planning my actions. Allison showed up again with the kids around 10 to 4 p.m. on Thursday afternoon. As I had suspected, she hadn't bothered to visit me earlier in the day, and I certainly wasn't going to call her, although Nancy said she had called the nurse's station once to inquire about my well-being. By the time the kids arrived on Thursday, I was feeling much better. This was not only because I was recovering, but also because I had had a very productive day. I had several people from my office visit me, as well as my attorney, Gail, who was drafting the prenup, and my parents had lunch with me. However, none of what I did had anything to do with my proximity sensor research. It all had to do with planning the rest of my life outside of work. After a wonderful half-hour session with the kids, as I had asked Nancy to do earlier in the day, she came in and told me I needed to rest. Allison did the same thing she had done the first day, but this time I kept my eyes open when she talked to me. Honey, you never called today for me to come over and discuss our situation, she said in a soft voice. I guess I wasn't important enough to you to know if I was dead or alive until I called, huh? I shot back, trying to minimize the sarcasm in my comment, but probably not succeeding. That's not fair, honey, she replied softly. I didn't want to bother you if you didn't want to talk. I'll probably want to talk this weekend. Darn, I said in an acerbic voice, after I'm released. Brian, again, I'm really sorry. I really hope we can get through this, she muttered. Then she took my hand and kissed it. I didn't react in any way. Bye, she said modestly as she waved me off on her way out. Of course, I didn't lose sight of the fact that she never once said she loved me, nor did she intend to end her affair with Roger Mayberry, and the only sign of real grief I could feel was that she'd been caught. The other 10% of my plan that I hadn't yet perfected was now easy to come up with. Just before visiting hours ended, Allison's father and mother came to see me. I was a little surprised until they revealed the reason for their visit. Apparently, Allison felt that it would not be good if she was the one to threaten me with losing the children in the event of our divorce, so she had instructed her parents to do so. Allison told us about her big mistake, her mother said, holding my hand. Oh, really? What is it? I asked Riley. After a long pause, her mom replied, you know very well that she was the one who caused your accident. I just hope you can find it in your heart to forgive her, Brian. You're such a good man and a loving father, and I know it would destroy you if you weren't there for your children every day. You're certainly right about that, Ruth, I said in a somber voice. The gloominess was only a pretense. The most important thing in my plan was to get sole custody of the children. A few more minutes later, after Allison's parents had given me the message I was sure their daughter was supposed to give me, they left. All doubt about what I was to do was gone. Friday morning, Dr. Petra gave me another checkup and then signed my release papers. Remember to take it easy for at least a week, she said. Scout's honor, I said, giving my semblance of a Boy Scout salute. Having never been a Boy Scout, I don't know how close I was, but at least she laughed. I thanked Nancy and offered her $500 cash, which she had to refuse so I gently hugged her and left with my assistant Jack by 10 a.m. Getting back at Roger Mayberry would have been very easy. I could have just fired him. But that would not have been enough revenge for me. I needed to destroy his career. If he had just found another job in a related field with almost the same pay, what kind of punishment would that have been? I needed to make him lose his security clearance. That would make it impossible for him to get a job even close to the remuneration or prestige he currently enjoyed. After consulting with Gail and the divorce specialist she recommended, and after getting Roger's bank account information from the payroll department, since his paycheck was being transferred directly, all I had to do was meet with Jezebel. Why her? She would help me get sole custody of the children. My assistant drove me to Jezebel's office, but I asked him to wait in the car. Even though Jack would be completely in on all my plans, I needed to talk to Jezebel alone. I called ahead, but Jezebel was still surprised and excited to see me. Wait, Jezebel, I laughed. I have a concussion and I can't hug you as tightly as I'd like. Why don't we just kiss each other's hands? 
You bastard, she giggled. You probably only got a concussion so I couldn't tear you apart. We exchanged hand kisses, a very unsatisfactory greeting, but it had to do. Jezebel looked well. She was dressed very stylishly but professionally and looked like she hadn't gained a pound since she was 18. There was a little gray in her hair, but it had softened her facial features. Yes, she was still a consummately beautiful woman. Come into my office, she demanded, grabbing my hand. After expressing my joy at seeing Jezebel again, I got straight to the point. I need your help, Jezebel, I said, and my sadness asserted itself again. Anything, Brian, she replied, taking my hand. You have no idea how much I want to help you, whatever it is. You helped me realize my dream, so if I don't have to kill anyone, I'll be all for it. That comment and her wide smile as she said it helped dispel my sadness more than I would have guessed. Okay, you asked for it, I grinned. I didn't miss a single detail in what had happened and my reaction that I needed her help with. This included me telling her how important my children were to me and even showing her pictures of them. When she heard that my middle child's name was Whitney, she froze. You named her Whitney? she exclaimed. I knew what she was thinking, and there was absolutely no reason, in light of the current circumstances, why I shouldn't decorate a lily. Yes, named after my favorite person before I was married, I replied with a broad smile. She choked, started to cry, and between sobs she wailed, You bastard! I've only cried twice in the last ten years because of you! I smiled, squeezing her hand. Hey, tears of joy are great! I could use some right now! How can I help deliver them? She asked, wiping away her tears. I need you to post videos of my wife on your website and transfer the money for them to her bank account. When she recovered from the initial shock, we discussed the situation comprehensively. She had many good suggestions and one impressive one. You have to make sure that it can never be traced back to you and someone can find out that you and I had a previous connection, she said. Is that what you call it, an association? I laughed. Shut up, she giggled. It's my turn to teach you. I have a friend who can do it on a paid site even more popular than mine, no questions asked. All you have to do is wire him the money, and he in turn will transfer it to your wife's bank account. Let me call him right now. In a four-minute phone conversation with her friend, Jezebel had everything set up. She told me what format the videos should be in, and that any money I gave her would be given to her friend, and the same amount would be transferred to Allison's account. Also, my friend will need your wife's signature on the contract that includes authorization to film. Can you trick her or forge it properly? I can, I replied. I'll email it to you today, she replied. Wait until tomorrow. I'll set up a new email account at the library specifically for this purpose and send it to you as soon as she signs. I grinned. At the risk of feeling hurt, I kissed her on the lips as I left. Fortunately, shortly after we were married, my wife insisted that the credit card be in her name only and the bank account in her name only. I hadn't bothered to check them before, but I certainly will now. I would have no trouble recognizing the numbers from the paperwork she had left at home in the den. I had plenty of chances to exact my revenge. Roger and Allison's bank account numbers, Allison's credit card number, enough of my own money to fund anything I wanted, and Jezebel's help. Also, my assistant Jack was totally loyal, and I could rely on him for anything. I should say something about Jack. He is my assistant, not my secretary. He is my highest paid employee, not counting the CEOs and CFOs of my companies. While he has an engineering background and is great at crunching numbers and making technical improvements to my fancy schematics, he's also willing to do whatever it takes to help. That's why he picked me up from the hospital and waited outside Jezebel. One more thing. He played division of my soccer in college and played the middle linebacker position his senior year. He's six feet two inches and 245 pounds of almost pure muscle. He has a hard time getting jackets he doesn't pull his hands out of. Everything about my revenge could have gone wrong, but I had planned it carefully and had to be optimistic. After Jack dropped me off at my car outside my house, I didn't go inside to see if Allison was home. I had lunch and then called Allison's cell phone. Hi, honey. I'm so glad you called. Do you want me to come over to your place? She sang out as my cell phone number was listed on her caller ID. That won't be necessary, I said without any warmth in my voice. They let me off early, so I'll pick up the kids and then take them to milkshakes. 
We'll be home around half past five. Oh, honey, I should make you a nice homecoming dinner, she purred, trying her best to sound cheerful. Just don't ruin their appetite. I interrupted her. Thanks for the parenting advice, I replied sarcastically. I'll see you at half past five. The kids were happy to see me, curious about my health and lively about their activities. They were even more excited when I told them we were going to go have milkshakes at the local malt store, which they all loved. After all four of us were all excited about our shakes, I opened up to them. Kids, I want you to know that some things are going to change in the future, and it's not your fault, I began softly, offhandedly. That didn't fool Amber one bit. Without hesitation, she didn't just anticipate what I was going to say, she extrapolated my words. If you and mom get divorced, I'll live with you, she purred. You're getting divorced? asked Whitney. Let's not rush things, I said, trying to calm them down, especially Whitney, who suddenly looked like a dog. Mom and I are having some problems, and I don't know how it's going to end. But I want you to know that no matter what, we both love you with all our hearts, and you three beautiful creatures are in no way the cause of our problems. Amber shook me to my core again. You love us with all your heart, but does mommy have one? Mom loves us, Jerry picked up on that. Don't be so sure, Amber snapped back. Trying to be as diplomatic as possible, I put my hand on one of Amber's arms. Honey, I know that mommy loves you all without exception. Sometimes she just doesn't know how to show it. Let's not think badly of her, and let's hope things get better. Whitney sobbed quietly but Jerry and Amber seemed completely exhausted, especially when Jerry asked with eight-year-old sincerity, Daddy, will you come to my little league game tomorrow at noon? It's a game against the Ravens and I'll be pitching. I wouldn't miss that event for anything, son, I grinned. What activities do you girls have on Saturday? I asked, in as chipper a voice as possible. I lost three days due to a hospital stay and never got a proper update for Thursday. By the time we got home around 20 past 5, all three kids looked optimistic. I made sure to keep at least one child between Allison and me at all times during Allison's greeting, since I didn't want any body contact with her. After the kids went to bed, I walked into the guest room. Don't you want to talk? asked Allison. My head is splitting from the concussion, and I just need to take some pain pills and get some sleep. It probably won't be a good night's sleep, and I don't want to bother you, I replied as I swallowed the two Tylenol I passed off as prescription pain pills and then closed the door. I'm ready to talk anytime, Allison beeped as the guest room door closed behind her. On Saturday and Sunday, I managed to avoid any real conversation or intimacy with Allison without much trouble, and I was able to proceed with my plan. The first steps were simple. Using Allison's credit card, I ordered two small high-tech video cameras and motion detectors on Saturday morning which were to be delivered to the house on Monday. At the library, I printed out the contract that Jezebel had emailed me and immediately deleted it. I also printed out the new benefits and health insurance forms from my company's database, pinned the contract penultimate in the stack, and bookmarked where Allison was supposed to sign it all. I knew Allison would be in a compliant mood this weekend, but it wouldn't last too long. On Sunday, I handed her the paperwork, told her it was health insurance, disability insurance, and life insurance forms for work that just needed to be renewed, and that she and the kids were co-beneficiaries of all my insurance. I left the documents with her, telling her to read them at her leisure. I knew she wouldn't read them all, but would read the first one or two. When she saw her name in the first two as a beneficiary, she smiled, obviously believing that despite my aloofness, I was not going to divorce her. Smiling broadly, she brought me the papers a few minutes after I handed them to her. It's all signed, honey. She beeped, handing them to me as I started a card game with Whitney and Jerry. Thank you, I said, and as nonchalantly as possible, I moved the documents into my open briefcase and dealt the cards. I also called the CEO of the company I owned, where Roger Mayberry worked, and asked him to ask the federal agency in charge of our security clearances to schedule security clearance checks on five people from Mayberry's department. Because of the sensitive nature of our work, we are subjected to random security checks the way some organizations are subjected to random drug testing, so none of the employees were supposed to know that the checks were initiated by their employer, not the government. On Monday morning, after the kids left for school, Allison insisted on talking. 
Brian, we can't ignore what happened. If we do, it will eat away at you and destroy our relationship, she began, sitting across from me at the kitchen table. I wanted to say what relationship, but refrained. Instead, I said, Allison, my head is still spinning, and I haven't yet come to terms with what I witnessed. I need to get my head straight before we can have a meaningful conversation. I'm not going to do anything rash. Okay, dear, she replied after a slight delay, clearly pleased if not happy. I hope you feel better soon. I'm anxious to show you how much I care for you. I have to go to the country club for a social committee meeting in half an hour, and I'll be back around two to pick up the kids from school in time. Will you manage without me? she asked. In response to her question, I wanted to say, I'll know soon enough, but again held back. Have a good time, I'll be fine, I replied. She was oversimplifying things. About half an hour after she left, a courier delivered the cameras. I called Jack, he came over, and the two of us installed the cameras, switches, and motion sensors in the master bedroom in less than an hour. We handled all the equipment with latex gloves so as not to leave fingerprints or DNA. Then we had to route the signal to Allison's computer. If I'm great with computers, Jack is a wizard. All we have to do is find her password, and it will take me 10 minutes to connect the cameras to her computer. I have the most effective password cracking program on my laptop. I'll connect mine to hers and get to work, Jack announced, still wearing his latex gloves. Launching the program, Jack started to say, what can we do while it's running? But was interrupted by a beep. What's that? I asked. Is it malfunctioning? I don't think so. Heck, it's already cracked, he laughed. How is that possible? I asked. The program first tries a thousand of the most common passwords before applying the cracking algorithms. <laughs> Her password is princess, the 28th most common password, according to the program. Makes sense, I grinned. She's never listened to anything else I have to say about technology. So why would she listen when I tell her to make a password out of random characters? True to his word, within 10 minutes, Jack had the cameras recording to a file with an involuntary name on Allison's computer. After another five minutes, he had everything set up so that I could access the file from my office at my convenience and could turn the cameras and motion detectors on and off remotely. On Tuesday, I went to work as I was feeling good and turned on the cameras and motion detectors as I left. I arranged for a shell corporation I owned in the Cayman Islands to wire $10,000 to Roger Mayberry's bank account. After that, I was feeling good emotionally and making good physical progress recovering from my concussion, so I really got down to real work. Tuesday night, after the kids went to bed, Allison came up to me. Why don't you come back to our bed tonight? Your head must be feeling better if you can work tonight. It does, I replied. I feel almost normal. On Wednesday and Thursday, I almost let myself fantasize about Allison realizing how much she'd hurt me, actually loving me, and even breaking up with Mayberry. Of course, that didn't stop me from turning on the cameras when I wasn't home or going ahead with my plan because I knew those thoughts were just fantasy, not reality. This was confirmed when I reviewed the videotape from Thursday afternoon. I uploaded Allison's Thursday morning recording to the website, delivered $5,000 in cash to Jezebel, and by Friday evening, the $5,000 had been transferred from the website to Allison's bank account and the video posted for all paying customers to view. Unfortunately, since the site didn't have permission from Mayberry, they had to pixelate his face. All by law. Over the next two weeks, two more videos were uploaded to the site, two more $5,000 were transferred into Allison's bank account, and another $10,000 from another company in the Cayman Islands was transferred into Mayberry's bank account. Now I needed to follow through before Allison and Mayberry got their bank statements for the last month and wondered what the hell was going on. The day after the third video was made available to the public, Mayberry had a security check. How it happened, I don't know, but the checker had with him an unpixelated copy of one of the videos, as well as Mayberry's bank statement. Mayberry was the third person in his group to be interviewed that day, so I'm sure he didn't know that his interview was the only important one. Since the CEO was given a copy of the polygraph results and the questions and answers, I received a copy of the interview transcript by the end of the day when Mayberry was interviewed. After Mayberry was hooked up to the polygraph and dispensed with the preliminary questions, the reviewer prodded him. Mr. 
Mayberry, do you have any activities outside of work that someone could blackmail you with? No, I don't think so, Mayberry replied, getting a sharp twitch of the lie detector needle. I'd like to show you a video, Mr. Mayberry, the reviewer continued, pressing a few buttons on his iPad. Who is this woman you were doing this with two weeks ago Thursday? Apparently, Mayberry's face lost color as he contemplated whether he should try to lie or tell the truth, and which would be worse for his admittance. Apparently, he decided to come clean. Allison Banks. Isn't she married to one of your co-workers, Brian Banks? Well, actually, Brian Banks works for a different company, although his office is in the same building as mine. It's a big building, Mayberry stammered. Did you ever think that having an affair with a married co-worker could lead to blackmail? I never thought about it, Roger muttered. Have you received any payments from foreign organizations since your last security clearance? Absolutely not, Roger replied indignantly. Let me show you your bank statement for this month, Mr. Mayberry. What are the deposits from two different corporations based in the Cayman Islands for? There was a long pause. With a tremor in his voice, Mayberry replied, I don't know. I've never seen one before. It must be some kind of mistake. A mistake by two different companies from the Cayman Islands whose owners we have not been able to ascertain? The columnist continued. Yeah, someone's setting me up, whined Mayberry, clearly completely frustrated. Did someone fake the video of you and Mrs. Banks too? Inquired the reviewer, in whose voice I'm sure there was sarcasm even though he was supposed to remain impartial. After a few other questions, the interview was concluded. Mayberry answered nothing when, after disconnecting the electrodes from the lie detector, the reviewer said, Mr. Mayberry, until you are told otherwise, you must not come into contact with anyone involving confidential and sensitive information. Nor should you come into contact with Mr. or Mrs. Banks, or either of the two corporations that deposited the money in your account. Otherwise, you will be held accountable. The next day I got the kids ready for school. Allison looked at me with nothing but an icy stare. As soon as the kids left, I made a phone call, and 30 seconds later the doorbell rang. It's for you, slut, I grinned. How dare you talk to me like that, asshole, Allison muttered. I won't be that long, bitch, I replied, now really laughing. When Allison opened the door, the bailiff handed her the divorce papers. All I heard was, Mrs. Allison Banks? Yes. You've received a summons. In addition to the divorce papers were pictures with Mayberry and the name of a pay site with a password to access it. You didn't think I'd find out you were selling your videos, you nasty bitch? I asked as she stood at the kitchen table stunned. Have you even looked at what you look like on the site? Here's a way to find out, shouted I as she picked up the piece of paper with the website address and password. I couldn't believe it when my assistant brought it to my attention. Not only did you disrespect me by cheating on me, but you're broadcasting it and making money off of it. I, uh, what? I have no idea what's going on, she replied, tears in her eyes. I'm taking the kids on a weekend trip, I announced, standing up. Make sure you hire the best lawyer you can. I'm sure your professional earnings will help, because you're going to need one. That same day, Mayberry was fired, escorted out of the building, and stripped of her security clearance. About an hour before I was supposed to leave to pick up the kids for the weekend, my secretary called on the intercom. Brian, it's been reported that Roger Mayberry is drunk, is in the parking lot, and is yelling your name. Should I call the police? No, Sherry, I chuckled. Call Jack and have him come here right away. It was too good to be true. When Jack arrived, we walked over to the window in our building that overlooked where Mayberry was. It was a spot that had one of the best views of the security cameras. From the way he was rocking back and forth, it was clear he was drunk. We quickly came up with a plan. Jack went out one of the side doors and stayed close to the building, out of the camera's view, while I boldly walked out the front door. As soon as Mayberry saw me, he yelled, You goddamn asshole, Banks! You're the reason I got fired and messed up my security clearance! I know it! I'm going to kick your ass. I trotted, trotting rather than running, toward the spot that was in the camera's field of view, next to where Jack was. I let Mayberry get close enough to hit me. Although it was only a glancing blow to my shoulder, I felt as if it was the most crushing blow in history. 
As Mayberry rose above me, ready to deliver another blow, Jack appeared in the camera's field of view, grabbed Mayberry, and hit him in the jaw with his forearm as if he were a running opponent. Mayberry flew back four meters, losing consciousness. Jack came over to me and helped me up, and I leaned against the car and pretended to be groggy. Jack called 911. All of this was happening in full view of the security cameras, and the cops arrived three minutes later. Mayberry was handcuffed to the stretcher the fire department car had taken him on, and one of the cops went with him in the ambulance to the hospital. I filled out the necessary paperwork to file an assault charge, then picked up the kids and left for a weekend at a beautiful mountain resort. At the end of the weekend, I told the kids that Allison and I were getting a divorce. Amber seemed happy. The other two took it surprisingly calmly, taking to heart my assurance that we would both treat them with the utmost love. When we returned Sunday night, Allison turned out to be not at all as nasty as I thought she would be. In preparation for her possible breakdown, I had moved all of my most valuable possessions and clothes into a temperature-controlled storage unit. However, I had no intention of moving out of the house. When the kids told her about what we had done during our fun weekend, we had a talk with her. I know you set up that video shoot, Brian, though I don't know how you did it, were her first words, though in a more conciliatory tone than I would have guessed. No apology, no it was a mistake, no please forgive me, I asked. Just accusing me of something I, by all accounts, didn't do, I replied, trying not to give away my indignation in case she was recording our conversation. I've been busy this weekend, Brian. I hired a lawyer and a computer expert. Again, I don't know how you did it, but you've covered your tracks really well, and it's going to be hard for me to beat this unfit mother accusation you've leveled at me. However, I hope we can come to some sort of resolution about custody. Of course we can, Allison. You give me sole custody in the house so the kids don't have to move, and I'll give you free visits. I'll also buy you a house where you and Mayberry can get high. Did you hear he's not only out of work, but out of a career? I don't want to live in the same house as Roger. That's not the point. It's... she began. I quickly interrupted her. I don't want to hear it, Allison, snapped I. Regaining my composure, I continued. You can sleep with whoever you want. I just don't care. I'm just making a suggestion. After standing for a moment and brushing away a couple tears, she continued. Look, I know you think I'm a shitty mom, but I'm not. I love my kids with all my heart, and I can't bear the thought of not being able to live with them. I also don't see how it's in our best interest to fight in court. I know you will slander me in every way possible, and I don't have the energy for that. And neither of us want the kids to know all the details or watch the video. I agree. We don't want the kids to know the details, I pondered. What do you suggest? I asked, genuinely curious. My lawyer suggests we agree to accept mediation services. He says a former family court judge would be the best fit. I'll agree to sole or joint custody and you can do the same. We will let the mediator look into everything, including the children's wishes, and agree to whatever he decides. That way, we'll maintain confidentiality and we can get a decision much faster, she replied. I was actually shocked that she could be so reasonable. I think she realized that I had a much stronger character than she gave me credit for, as I'm sure she had several long conversations with Roger Mayberry. Let's have a joint meeting with our attorneys early next week and go over all the details, I said. I have only one exception to what you suggested. I will not agree to joint custody under any circumstances. It's too hard on the children and I want sole custody. If the mediator orders it, I will agree, but only then. I'm not suggesting that. I let Allison take the master bedroom while I slept in the guest room. I didn't bother explaining the reason to her, not wanting to increase her stress level. But now that it was all figured out, there was no way I would sleep where Mayberry was entertaining her. On Tuesday, we had a joint meeting with our attorneys. We both instructed our attorneys to just do what we asked, legally. We didn't want them to haggle. The agreement we came to called for a 50-50th split of all marital property, except what was excluded in the prenuptial agreement, which was 90% of our wealth. The name of the mediator, a former family court judge in good standing, when a hearing would be scheduled and when the mediator's secret judgment was due. The amount of child support I would pay if Allison got sole or joint custody of any child. The amount of child support I would pay Allison for two years or until she remarried, depending on the... It took a full day to iron out the details, but we got through it. The potential mediator was contacted the next day. He agreed to handle the case and set a fee, 
to be paid 50-50 out of our joint assets not covered by the prenup. And we even set a briefing date in two weeks and a hearing date in four weeks. I didn't force Allison to put this into the contract, but I talked to her about it privately, and we both agreed that neither of us would bring the other into our home while we jointly occupied it, and that once a custody decision was made, whoever had to leave the home would do so within two weeks. In addition, I agreed to have my attorney threaten the pay site with a lawsuit if they didn't take down her video and refund their money. Of course, this required no effort on my part. One call to Jezebel took care of that. While waiting for the hearing, Allison and I were very polite to each other. I never tried to influence the kids, and to my knowledge, neither did she, and we never made any mean or even sarcastic remarks to each other, even in private. On the day of the hearing, I was nervous, even though I was sure I had the upper hand and that the worst that could happen was joint custody. But since I really wanted sole custody, I was almost frantic. The hearing went pretty well, although before the judge started interviewing the children, he made a few remarks that made my stomach churn. He seemed to be leaning toward joint custody. Before he began interviewing the children, he challenged us. I see that you have agreed to watch my interviews with the children on closed circuit television, the mediator said. I'm sorry, I can't agree to that. I apologize for not realizing it just a few minutes ago, but it would destroy the necessary candor and trust I need to communicate with the children. If any of you cannot agree to me meeting with each child alone, I will have to refund your money and recommend another mediator. Since the interviews with the children were due tomorrow anyway, the day they are out of school, let me know before then. I was almost tempted to say I disagreed and hope we could find another mediator less prone to joint custody than this one. My attorney talked me out of it, especially since she knew of Amber's antipathy toward Allison and from past experience with the mediator when he was a judge. It was clear that he listened to the children's wishes. Amber was only a year away from the point at which, under state law, she could make her own decisions, and the judge would likely listen to what she had to say more than any other mediator we would invite. Before Allison and I went home, we met with our attorneys and agreed to the mediator's stipulation. We also agreed that we would not question the children afterward about what they had said. That night at dinner, Allison made some remarks that I thought the children took as an expression of her desire for joint custody. I only gave her a stern look and said nothing in response. Amber caught my gaze and smiled slyly. The next day, the mediator met privately with each of the children. The conversation with Jerry only took 20 minutes. Whitney's, about half an hour. Amber's, over an hour. As Amber was walking out, making sure Allison and her lawyer weren't watching, she gave me a thumbs up. As per our arrangement, Allison's parents took the kids out to eat after the interview, instructing them to get back to our house around 4 p.m. After we broke for lunch, the mediator was ready to pass judgment. We didn't expect this. He was contractually obligated to have another week to make a decision, so there was no obligation to make it then. He didn't even want to listen to the 30 minutes of closing arguments the lawyers had prepared. Having reviewed all of the evidence before me and considering that the best interests of the children are paramount, I award sole custody of all three children to the father, Brian Banks. I also find that under the circumstances, the agreement entered into by the parties prior to the case being referred to me is reasonable and in the best interests of the children, so the case will be settled on those terms. On Monday, I will provide you with a certified copy of this summary judgment to submit to the family court along with the settlement agreement. Thank you for trusting me with this case, and good luck in the future. Allison and I both cried, for different reasons. The ride home was somber. I was in no mood to gloat and she was despondent. My longtime enemy, Sadness had descended upon me again with the final dissolution of our family, though it had happened on the best of terms for me, given that the dissolution was necessary. Allison was out that night when we told the kids, so I had to do most of the talking. Jerry and Whitney were saddened and hugged Allison sincerely. Amber gave her a formal hug. I only said nice things about Allison and told them what the visitation would be like. I bought another house for Allison less than a week after the hearing and she moved into it within the two-week time frame we had agreed upon. The kids, her parents, and my brother and I helped her, and we hired a moving company for the large items she was taking from our house, including the double bed from the bedroom. When the divorce was final a few months later, I threw a victory party at the house to thank everyone who helped me, as well as my close friends and parents. I didn't explain to the kids what the purpose of the party was. I just said it was a celebration in general. Amber, who was now 13, of course guessed it. 
Just before the guests were to arrive and I was making last-minute preparations in my room, she came in and closed the door. She made me sit down and then settled into my lap. Daddy, how glad are you that the custody agreement turned out the way it did? A difficult question, even for her. I'm very happy, Amber. Why do you ask? I replied. She smiled broadly. I knew it would work out when I talked to the mediator. I told him that I saw my mom and that guy from Mayberry doing it in our house when I came home sick one day, and it had a terrible effect on me. You saw them, I replied, stunned. What difference does it make, really? She was cheating. I would have refused to go with her if she had been awarded custody of me, and I knew it would be better for Jerry and Whitney if they stayed with us. I just thought you might be interested to know, she concluded with a wide grin. She kissed my cheek, jumped off my lap, and walked away. I decided not to continue this conversation. What kept me busy from the victory celebration, though, was Jezebel. Jezebel came to the party with a million-dollar view. She immediately made friends with Jerry and Whitney. She played Trap and Pepper, a ball game for baseball players, with Jerry for half an hour. She was much better at it than I was. Jezebel sat down one-on-one -on -one with Whitney. I don't know what they talked about, but they chatted and laughed for an hour. Amber acted more reserved with Jezebel than she did with the other two kids, but she seemed to respond positively to her too, and they talked about fashion. Jezebel didn't leave me out of the loop in caring for our family. In the middle of the party, she isolated me in a den and said, Let your parents stay with the kids tonight, and you come home with me. I promise you'll be alive when I let you come back tomorrow morning at 10, although I can't guarantee you'll be conscious. That night was unforgettable. Looking into my eyes, she said, I see you as kind, generous, and intelligent. Why don't you take me to a resort with you the weekend of the 14th for three days, and we can see if we both want a real relationship. I want a man who will be mine and only mine. And then closed the door behind me with the words, Go home to your beautiful children. Epilogue. Two years after my victory party, there have been a number of changes in my life. All three children are well settled, happy, thriving in school, social life, and activities. Allison has done nothing wrong, has taken full advantage of her visitation rights, and has done nothing to abuse them. Amber has a much better relationship with her now than she had when we were a family. What's more, Amber even went with her and two other children to Allison's parents' lake house for 10 days last summer, and she had no negative feedback upon her return. My business is thriving, and I am making more money than ever. However, my involvement in operating companies was inadvertently exposed when a report we filed with the government was sent out to a few employees we didn't realize we had. Even that got around, though, and no one treats me any differently than they used to. Roger Mayberry left town shortly after the victory party and, according to the only employee who still keeps in touch with him, took a job as an entry-level salesman at a non-secret electronics firm on the West Coast. The kids are more than resigned to Jezebel. All three look at her more as a friend than a mother, and they really enjoy her company. After two years, Jezebel decided we should be exclusive. Last month, she sold her website and moved in with us and the kids. Although she doesn't want to get married, she only wants me, and she wants to fulfill her duties as a friend mother to the kids while running a small company selling specialty clothing online from an outbuilding I added to the house for that purpose. At the same time I built the extension, I installed the best quality soundproofing in the bedroom. I asked myself, am I the most satisfied man in America? Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, so subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.